Finally, let us study the central limit theorem, which says the sum of the sum of a large number of independent random variables will be approximately normally distributed regardless of their individual distributions. So that means if we have a lot of random variables, x1, x2, x3, and so on, and it is important that these random variables do not have to follow the normal distribution. Or, the, each of these random variables may follow completely different uh, distributions. But still, if we take the summation of these, sum over all these many, many random variables, then approximately this summation will follow a normal distribution with some mean and some variance. Of course, we need to import some conditions. You know, this cannot be applied to any random variables. I mean, not many, uh, all random possible random variables, but uh, those random variables must have some properties. Okay. For example, these random variables must have means. So if you have uh, calculate the expectation value of these random variables, this has to be finite. I mean, it, I mean otherwise it cannot be defined. So I want to and so on. And also uh, the variance must be well defined. So this should be finite. And we also impose mo stronger conditions. Like uh, all the moments exist. So that means expectation value of powers of these random variables. So let's say k. Okay. should be finite. So k is 1, 2, and so on. So when k is 1, it's just expect, oh, sorry, this is not uh, mu i, it should be xi. When k is 1, it's just expectation value. When k is 2, it's uh, when it converges, then we can define the variance. So this is a necessary condition. But in addition to those, we also impose that higher moments do exist for all these random variables. OK. So let us calculate. Uh, suppose we have the moment generating function for xi minus mu i, where mu i is now let us assume each of these random variables has the mean mu i and variance sigma i squared. So i is from 1 to up to n. And also we assume all these moments. Let's say moment of kth moment of the random variable xi. Okay. OK. 
and then assume this. Now, then calculate the the moment generating function for this random variable. Rather than xi itself, we calculate the uh, moment generating function for xi minus mu i, where mu i is the expectation value of x. So let's call it mi of t, which is defined as the expectation value of exponential t xi minus mu i. So let's have this mu, uh, moment generating function. And we defined y as the sum of all these random variables. So since uh, expectation value is independent, this uh, expectation value of y is the sum of expectation values of, uh, let's see. So expectation value of y is sum of xi's, which is sum of expectation values of xi's, which is sum of mu i's. Okay, and also since all x1, x2, and so on, they are independent, the variance of y is just sum of the variances. So that's sigma i squared. So this is are obtained because all these are independent. Okay, so uh, we define this moment generating function and now we calculate the moment generating function for uh, this y minus mu where mu is the expectation value of y, okay, which is the summation of mu i's. So uh, the moment generating function of y minus mu so how can we calculate this? Because y minus mu is actually the sum of xi minus mu i by the definitions of y and mu. So we can write, rewrite this as xi mu i and split this expo uh, exponential function into the product of exponential functions. So that is x1 minus mu1 times x2 minus mu2 times and so on and xn minus mu n. But uh, x1, x2, and so on, they are independent, so we can split the expect expectation value of a product into the product of expectation values. Okay, so this is equal to this times expectation value of e x2 minus mu2, and so on. So in short, uh, this is each of these 
is the moment generating function for the corresponding random variable. So we have m1t times m2t times and so on, mn of t. Okay. Now, let us consider the standardized random variables of y sigma where sigma squared is the variance of y which is actually the sum of sigma i squared okay so if we want to calculate uh, the moment generating function of z then that is the moment generating function of y uh, actually y minus mu but uh, what did I do? okay so this is this is m of t so this should be m okay t over sigma over sigma which is these products so m1 t over sigma m2 t over sigma mn t over sigma and so on okay now when n is sufficiently large that means sigma squared which is the sum of sigma 1 squared sigma 2 squared and so on okay so if you if you compare this sigma with each of sigma i's sigma 1 sigma 2 and so on it should be that sigma 1 squared is a lot smaller than sigma squared and in fact any of these sigma i's are a lot smaller than sigmas right so let's have uh, let's expand each of these moment generating functions in Taylor series. So, in general, we have m. Let's say m1. Let's say mi t over sigma is you know expand around t equal to zero. Okay. Around t equal to zero. So when t is 0, the moment generating function has the value of 1. So this is 1. Okay. And when, uh, if you dif differentiate this function, then, uh, let's see, mm. differentiate this function once and put t equal to zero that gives you the the average of the random variable calculated uh, used for calculating this moment generating function which was xi minus mu i so the expectation value of this should be zero right because the expectation value of xi is mu i so this is equal to this minus mu i which is zero so this is zero so the first derivative when evaluated at t equal to zero gives zero okay and the second derivative evaluated at t equal to zero gives you uh, the variance of xi 
minus mu i. So m i first derivative uh, is zero. And second derivative gives us the variance of uh, variance of x i minus mu i. So that is sigma i squared. Okay, so that is sigma i squared over two. And we try to expand in terms of this t over sigma. So that's t over sigma squared. And similarly, we should have as the third uh, derivative, we have the third moment. Uh, I3. And 3 factorial and t over sigma to the power of 3, and so on. Okay, so this is the third moment around the mean. Okay, so we have this Taylor series, but uh, compared to Okay, so let's, this is zero, and compared to this term, this term is very small, and compared to this term, the third term is very very small, because it's you know, t, t. We are we are trying to evaluate t around zero, so t divided by sigma is a lot smaller. Uh, to the power of three is a lot smaller than t over sigma to the power of two. So approximately we can ignore all the higher order terms and just leave the first two terms okay approximately now <coughs> let's take uh, the logarithm of this one So log of m z t, which is log of product of all uh, moment generating functions, but uh, product of log of product is sum of logs, right? So that's I log m i t of sigma, and we expanded this in Taylor series and took left only the first two terms. So actually, this is approximately equal one plus sigma squared over two and t over sigma squared. Okay, but now uh, this term it's small compared to 1. So again we expand this logarithm into Taylor series and leave the first meaningful term to have uh, this 1 over 2 so that is just this term sigma i squared this is ugly, so. sigma i squared and t over sigma squared okay so this is again Taylor three expansion of logarithm around uh, this part being equal to 0 Okay, but in this summation, the only term that contains the index i is this part. So we can put everything out. 
So t sigma squared is out, and we take the summation of this. But this summation is equal to sigma squared by definition, right? So this sigma squared cancels this sigma squared, and what's left is 1 over 2 times t squared. So after all, this moment generating function uh, the log of this moment generating function is equal to this, so the moment generating function of z is approximately equal to e to the power of t squared over 2. But what is this? This is actually the moment generating function of the standard normal distribution. So that means this random variable z follows uh, this normal dis uh, standard normal distribution. So z follows standard normal distribution. So that means y follows, since z is the standardization of y, y follows the normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma squared, where mu is the sum of mu i's and sigma squared is the sum of uh, sigma i squared. So, therefore, we have proved uh, the central limit theorem. It is important to note the conditions for the central limit theorem to hold. So first of all, uh, the random variable y must be a sum of a large number of random variables. So x1, x2, xn. How large is sufficiently large depends on the problem, but uh, one or two random variables, this, that's not large. So maybe at least 10, more than 10, I would say, or preferably like hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of variables would be large enough in most cases. And second, these random variables must be independent. Why is this important? Because otherwise we cannot uh, calculate the moment generating function for y, right? Because in the calculation of mt, moment generating function for y minus mu, uh, independence was assumed, otherwise it was impossible to calculate this. And third, uh, the mean and variance and actually higher order moments uh, around the mean must exist for all of these random variables. Okay. Otherwise, uh, the moment generating functions for these uh, these random variables don't make sense. So unless these conditions are met, we cannot really apply the central limit theorem. Now, some of these conditions may be relaxed, depend, but we have to introduce other conditions. So there are, there are many versions of central limit theorems, but uh, the one we introduced here is the easiest one. But anyway, it cannot be applied without any conditions, right? So there are some conditions must that must be satisfied. Okay, for example, if you consider the Cauchy distribution, remember Cauchy distribution, which is diff it's a 
uh, continuous run uh, distribution with this uh, probability distribution function, uh, density function. Okay, x is any real number, and x zero and gamma, they are parameters. Okay, gamma must be positive, x zero maybe any real numbers. Okay, if you remember this, there are uh, if uh, x follows this distribution, then this doesn't exist. So therefore, if xi, x2, and so on, if they follow this type of distribution, then we cannot apply the central limit theorem. Now let's compare binomial distribution with normal distribution. Actually, we're going to approximate binomial distribution with a normal distribution. To do so, let's consider a collection of Bernoulli random variables. That is, we have x1, x2, and so on. They fo all follow the same Bernoulli distribution. That is probability of xi being 1 is given by p, and probability of xi being 0 is q, which is 1 minus p. Okay, so for each of i equal to 1 to up to n. So that means uh, the expectation value of xi let's call it mu i is p and the variance which we call sigma i squared is pq We've done this before, right? So if we define the sum of these random variable as y, then we know this y follows a binomial distribution with parameters n and p. So the probability that y takes a particular value k is given by n choose k, p to the power of k, q to the power of n minus k. Okay. And the mean of y, which we call mu, is given by np. And the variance of y which we call sigma squared, is given by npq. So we've done this before again. Now, let's apply the central limit theorem to this problem. So let's check if this uh, random variable y satisfy, satisfies the condition for the central limit theorem. First of all, y is defined as a sum of a large number of random variables. Let's assume this n is large enough. Okay, So the first condition is OK. And we are assuming these x1, x2, these are independent. So the second condition is also met. And of course, since they are Bernoulli random variables, each of these uh, random variables has so definite uh, mean and the variance. So the, all the conditions are met. So we can say that this random variable y approximately 
follows normal distribution with this mean and p and this variance and p q. But of course, this y is a discrete random variable, but normal distribution is a continuous probability distribution. So there is some difference. I mean, it can be an essential difference, but uh, we could write p probability of y taking the value of small y is approximately given by this density function 2 pi sigma is this one so let's put everything here and pq and exponential minus y minus n p squared 2 n p q times dy so this dy is an infinitesimal interval but we should consider this as 1 so that means dy represents an interval between y minus 1 over 2, 1 half and y plus 1 half something like that so this is actually a uh, discrete random variable but uh, formally this can be written as like uh, y uh, in this and this interval but anyway so in a previous example we have seen that in a, in a family with eight children, the probability that there are five boys is given by so 8 choose 5 p 5 q 3 is given by 0 0.2056 if p is 0 0.5147 okay so this is the is the correct result based on the binomial distribution. Now, by the application of the central limit theorem, this probability can be also calculated by the density function of the standard normal distribution. So that is So 1 over sigma of this, uh, so 3, wait a minute, oh, sorry, sorry, it's not 5 boys, it's 3 boys. Okay, so in this case, this phi is the density function of the standard normal distribution. So y is 3, and np and sigma. And sigma is, of course, square root of npq. So if we put all of the numbers together, it should be 1.4136. 3 minus 4.1176 1.4136 So if you calculate this it should be approximately 0 0.2065 If you compare this value with this value, they are pretty close. So, normal distribution can approximate the binomial distribution. But why do we want to do this, anyway, if we can calculate this one? Well, in this case, the number 
n is not so big, so it is possible to calculate directly. But when the number number here n is large, if the parameter n of binomial distribution n is large, we have to calculate something like this for a large number, which is not usually uh, possible with uh, ordinary computer programs. I mean, you need some special care. But if you uh, use the normal approximation, then there's no such problem. You can just calculate as usual for any number. So it's easier, usually. And, OK, that's for the binomial distribution. And, of course, the Poisson distribution is derived from the binomial distribution. So Poisson distribution can be also approximated by the normal distribution. And that is an exercise for you.